Now let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will hear the recording once only. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Okay, who's next, please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight three seven two from Singapore at eleven thirty, and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now, and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped, and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. Can I see your ticket, please? Here it is. So you came from Hong Kong today and changed planes in Singapore, right? Yes, the connection in Singapore was a tight one. The plane got in late, and I had to rush to get to the next flight. That's the problem right there. There wasn't enough time to get your bags onto the connecting flight. Normally, Singapore Airport is very efficient. Now I need you to fill in these forms. Your name, Jenny Lee. Address. I guess you want my address here. I'm staying with relatives. Just a minute, I'll have to look it up. It looks like five eight three. No, it's five three three East Sixty Seventh Street in Riverside. Do you have the phone number there? Yes, I do. It's um nine three o one four two six nine. So you came in on Qantas flight three nine two. Do you know the number of the flight out of Hong Kong? Let me see. I think it was Cathay Pacific nine o o or something. Oh yes, it says here CX nine one two. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. Now I need a description of the luggage. How many pieces did you check in? Just one. Can you describe it for me? Here is a picture to help you. Okay. It's a big bag like this one, rectangular, not hard shell but soft covered, and it has a zipper around the front. Is it black? No, sort of a grey colour. Any identification? Just a tag with my name on it. Any other features? Well, it has wheels and a retractable handle on the end, so you can pull it, as well as the handle in the middle. Okay, that's fine. Now, if your bag missed the connection, I'm sure it'll be put on the next flight. I'll email Singapore as soon as I finish here. The next flight comes in at seventeen fifty. That's ten to six this evening. You can pick it up then. Ten to six? That's too long to wait. Can I get my uncle to pick up the bag on his way home from work? Sorry, you have to be here yourself to clear customs. Of course, I almost forgot. Will the bag come here to this desk? Yes. You pick it up here, then take it over to the customs area. By the way, don't forget to bring your passport. You will also need to have the key plus your ticket with the baggage claim number on it. Oh, okay. Guess I'll have to come back tomorrow then. It's lucky I packed everything I need for now in my carry-on bag. Yes, that's always a good idea. Be prepared. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two.
Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald... The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 676, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. OK, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy you go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here... Clothes, uh, wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose, and clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long sleeve t shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. 
we do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs> uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. OK, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams and I really do need to study. OK, then. Let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out some... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two undergraduates doing a research methods course. A girl called Leela and a boy called Jake having a seminar with their tutor. Now you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well-written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. Oh, yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project... I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Section, you will hear an introductory lecture to a course on Southeast Asia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My name is Paul Stange. I'm coordinator of this course. It's called Southeast Asian Traditions. I'm also the author of the study guide and the course reader, and you should have those in front of you. As well as these, you'll need two textbooks for the course. There's the one by Osborne, and there's another by Legg. I'll talk a bit more about the reading materials in a moment. Now, if you haven't got these materials, you can buy the textbooks at the university bookshop, and you can collect the study guide and the course reader from me on your way out of the lecture.
The purpose of this lecture is simply orientation. What I'm going to do is introduce myself, talk you through the course, and give you some additional advice, apart from what's contained in the study guide, on dealing with the various assignments for the course. First of all, the materials. You'll find the two textbooks very clear, and they give a good basic coverage of the history of the region. Most of the reading materials in the reader are fairly easy going, but I have to warn you that two of them are quite difficult. These are the readings by Smale and Bender, and of these two, the one by Bender is perhaps the more challenging. But don't let that put you off, because understanding these two readings is important to help you develop a clearer understanding of the cultures. In other words, they'll help you acquire greater sensitivity to the differences between the various cultures in the region. Now, the course itself. The course has multiple aims. It's primarily a history course, but it's not only a history course. It is, in most respects, a cultural history course focusing on Southeast Asia. Nevertheless, the course is, as you'll see from the materials, an introduction to the Southeast Asian Studies component of the Asian Studies program. In looking at the cultural history of Southeast Asia, there are two major influences to be considered: the Chinese and the Indian. It's important not to forget the extensive influence that these two countries have had in the region. China has been trading throughout the region since at least the sixth century, so many of its cultural and social traditions have influenced the countries in the area, and religious practices from India have helped form today's culture. So we'll be looking for the links and the connections between traditional patterns and today's developments in the region. I think you can now begin to see how these past influences might form a background for the present-day social practices, and in the same way, this course will form a basis or background for second and third-year courses, with their focus on the modern period, and in particular the economic and political situation of the region. So that's the outline of the course. I'd like to go on now to look at what you have to do. Your assignments and so on. That is the end of part four.